Welcome back to the shop and to the channel. We've got an update here to the Prime Weld MiG 285 that I wanted to share with you. Back when I did a video on my first impressions with the machine, one of the things that I didn't really care for, not that it was a bad feature, was that there was no way to manually adjust wire feed speed and voltage independently. By default, the MiG-285 is a synergic welder, which means the voltage automatically gets set based on your wire feed speed setting. You can adjust the voltage, but only as a percentage of the default, and you only get plus or minus 15% at that. And once again, Prime Weld has proved why they are so popular with their customer base. They actually listen to what their customers want and what they need. So if you give them a call, they will ship you a new control board for your MiG-285 that will give you full manual control over wire feed speed and voltage. This does mean you're going to have to open up your welder and you're going to have to take the old board out and put the new one in. I'm not afraid to do that, so let's get started. Well, the first thing I need to do after unplugging the machine is to remove the MIG gun from the front. Well, I'm going to cut the wire that's in the torch lead, so after removing or loosening the wing nut that's inside the door that holds the connector, I'll just pull it partially out and then just snip the wire. And this will be easier to do if it's up on my primary workbench, so after I push all the clutter out of the way, I'll get the machine up here so I can start taking the case off. There are six screws that hold the front bezel on. There's two at the top, two in the middle, and two near the bottom. Just need to remove those all the way and then this whole front plastic piece will come right off. There are also six screws on the back, two at the top, two in the middle, but the two on the bottom are actually underneath the machine. I have to tip it over on its side in order to get to those two. And now we can remove the steel outer case. There's uh, some of these black screws at the bottom and on the top of the case. And then there's a few silver ones that were originally hidden by those plastic bezels on the front and back that we just removed. Before we can remove the case completely, I need to remove this ground strap. It's held on with a nut on a stud that needs a 7 millimeter wrench or nut driver to remove. <clears throat> I 
Next we need to remove these front knobs and we start by removing these little yellow plastic caps that go over the end. There's a screw in the center of the knob and you need to hold on to the knob itself in order for the screw to back out otherwise it just sits there and spins. Next there are two screws that hold on this cover that protects the circuit board. The next thing I did was to remove the four mounting screws that hold the circuit board to the front panel. I would not do it this way again. Um, as you'll see later, I would remove the ribbon cables and the power cord that attaches to the other side of this board. You'll see why I say that here in a minute. There's two more screws on this side of the board that need to come off. I was expecting once I got these two screws out that I would be able to slide this board out from behind the front panel in order to remove those cables that are connected to the back. Well it doesn't come out this way but it does look like it might go out the other way so in order to do that I need to remove these cables first. Well, there's a little bit of an adhesive that's holding those cables in place. I imagine it's there to protect them from rattling out during overseas shipment. So they're not coming out all that easy. Now there is this screw on the front panel that I'm pretty sure if I were to remove it, it would give me enough flex in the panel that I could maneuver the board out from behind it right now the reason why I can't is because of those two shafts that the knobs go on well at least on my machine they must have used red Loctite to hold the screw in because nothing I did could get it out I tried several screwdrivers and even tried a impact driver and it snapped off the front of the Phillips bit inside this screw. So I guess it's oh, staying there. It just busted off in there. And this is where I realized that taking those four mounting screws out beforehand was the mistake. So I'm going to remount the board back into the front panel in order to give it some stability so I can remove those cables. Well, the big ribbon cable, I was able to get both of my hands on it and just use a little patience rocking it back and forth until the adhesive went past its breaking point. For the two smaller plugs, I was able to get a small pair of channel locks back there and get enough on it to where I wasn't going to rip the wires out of the back of it, but I could pull it past the sticky bit. There we go. And now I'll go back and re-remove those four mounting screws. Well with the old board out I can unwrap the new one and we can see that they appear to be identical except for some identification numbers that are on some label. Well, reassembly is the disassembly in reverse. No mystery, no gotchas. Just make sure that those uh, knob shafts come through the hole before you put the second screw in. Otherwise, it won't fit. Maybe there is just one gotcha after all. Okay, so now reassembly is just disassembly in reverse. Well, 
But before I put everything back together, I want to plug it in, turn it on, and just test it to make sure that I didn't blow anything up. I'm just going to run some functional tests here. We're not going to weld anything just to see do the controls still operate the way that they did before I put the new board in. Well, the instructions say to put it in the manual mode, you're supposed to hold both up arrows simultaneously. This doesn't have up arrows. I did learn that what you want to do is hold this mode select arrow down until it pops up and says SYN on the left hand display. Of course, by default, it is on and just by turning the volts control, you can change it between off and on. And so now with Synergic welding off, you can see my wire feed speed and my voltage selections are completely independent of each other. And to turn Synergic back on, I just hold that arrow down again and then change the volt selection, turn it left for setting it on. Well, we might as well go ahead and do a little welding. The machine is completely back together now. We're set up for C25, and I've got about half inch, 3 8 inch material here, so we'll set it to 330 inches per minute. Let's turn off Synergic Welding and we'll go ahead and switch to manual mode and we're just going to play with some settings here. We'll try a little higher voltage, a little lower voltage. Let's see, we'll go to 25 volts and let's crank up the wire feed speed to 450 inches per minute or thereabouts. Well, that was throwing a ton of spatter everywhere. Let's try something a little different. Make another adjustment here. I'll lower the voltage down to 24 volts, and then we'll reduce the wire feed speed to around 415. So I have no expectation on actual results here, although I am hearing a difference in the way that it welds and also I can see a difference in how it's welding. I guess you can say I'm just validating that it's actually doing what the display says it's doing.
I'll reset this now back to synergic mode. Well, that was pretty easy and relatively painless, except for a couple of things I had to do different according to the instructions. It's my understanding that all machines shipping from the factory from this point will have the boards pre-installed. So if you have an older machine or if you're ordering one soon, you might want to give Gene or Dustin a call at PrimeWeld and ask for this upgrade. Well, that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.